Well, good morning. It is time to get started. Thankful for everybody being here this morning. <clears throat> we'll, uh, we'll get opened up with a, <clears throat> with a word of prayer, please. <clears throat> Our Father God, we're thankful, Lord, for the night's rest and thankful for the new year that you blessed us with and this, this new Lord's Day. We pray, God, that you be with each of the new classes and be with all the students and all the teachers, God, that we can dedicate uh, this, this next next few moments to study in your, your will and your word, God, and how it can be best applied to our lives. We're thankful for, for your goodness and how you've blessed us this past year and all the, all the riches that you've given us. Uh, we pray, Father, that you, that you continue to do so, and we know, Father, that even if you uh, decide not to, that our faith won't waver. We pray, Father, that you continue to strengthen us spiritually and, and physically and help us to grow stronger as individuals and as a church, and as, as we delve into to a new book this morning, God, that, that you will guard our hearts and guide our minds, Father, that we can um, best apply those things uh, that, your, that your inspired word was meant for. Have mercy on us and all the sick, God, to continue to direct us this day and throughout our lives to be more useful for you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. All right, so, so good morning. Uh, I want to welcome everybody to the class. In case you missed it, um, in the auditorium class outside, it's a study of zeal and how to be on fire and how to remain on fire for God and His church. So if you think you need to be there, you're not. So go ahead and go if you had planned to. Uh, in this room, we'll be studying the book of James. And in my mind, it, it's, taking, it's taking that zeal. It's taking that passion, that enthusiasm that we, uh, that we have for God's word, that we have for his people, and we have for his church. And James is telling Christians how to apply it and how to stay faithful. So the two classes, they, they, they feed off each other. And I've spoken with a few folks that said they were going to be in here one time and there the next time, and we'll kind of see how that, how that plays out. But, but anyway, from our time together this quarter, our goal will be to, to better learn how to practice um, Pure and undefiled religion before God, as we read in James chapter 1 and verse 27, with a focus on tests of faith and practical Christian living to help each Christian stay in the race that's set before each of us. Um, many times the, the idea of, of relevancy comes up with, with a certain study of, of certain issues or certain topics, uh, but, but the creator of time itself has given us a book that is, that is relevant um, and, and as relevant uh, uh, and as needed today in the God of the living as it was needed for the, for the early, early church um, and those saints that were converted from Judaism to Christianity. So the early church in Jerusalem was scattered abroad in the first century due to persecution and needed instruction concerning faith and works and perseverance in all of life's struggles so that they can continue to be obedient believers in Christ. It's my hope that as we study this epistle together, it will strengthen our faith and help us endure temptations in the form of trials, as well as temptation in the form of allurements to sin. I pray that our study will reflect our sincere desire to ascertain the, 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 the precise thoughts that the inspired writer of James desired to communicate to those in the early church and, and thus give us insight and understanding for our edification today. So, did, did everybody get a copy of, of the material? If you need some, let me know. We, we, there's still some up here. Well, I'd like to, I'd like to, to, to I guess, first to, to thank and give credit to the, to the Ember Hills Church of Christ in, in Atlanta, Georgia, specifically Larry Brown and Bill Sanchez, as I've borrowed their study material on, on, on James, and also using a couple other sources as well. But, um, so depending on, on how far we get today and maybe even Wednesday, we're just going to be talking or just going to be focusing on the intro and, and the preface of the book. 
So for those that haven't had a chance to look over the material, the first several pages is kind of an intro from, from this writer's standpoint before we even get to the lesson. So I know we'll be, we'll be interrupted with a gospel meeting and who knows, maybe some weather, the way it happens this time of year. So, but anyway, we'll do the best we can. Lord willing, if we do get through all, all five chapters, it doesn't sound like a lot, but this can be a chatty bunch sometimes in, in a study like this, so that's good. But if we do get through it, I think my thought would be to, to jump into Jude uh, and, and finish up the quarter there. But anyway, as we, as we get started, I mean, there's, uh, there's just some commentary notes from, from a man named James Ward that I'd like to, I'd like to read as we, as we start. It's titled here, A Brief Summary of What Is and What Is Not Contained in the Epistle of James. He says, I'm amazed at how practical this book is to everyday godly living in the 21st century. Everyone needs to study and make proper ed- application to the life. The message of this book will hurt one's feelings, step on one's toes, but at the same time it will strengthen one's faith beyond measure. So be prepared to receive with meekness, the engrafted word which is able to save your souls, as we read in James 1.21. When studying a passage from the inspired text, realize God is speaking through divine inspiration. When one's conscience condemns, then instantly go to God in prayer and confess to him their faults and shortcomings. One must always be willing to make changes according to what was just learned. James, he goes on to say, James gives admonition to God's people which will enable the sincere followers of Christ to withstand the temptations of life and to resist the devil in their daily lives. This letter advises to persevere during the trials of faith, to not show partiality of the rich over the poor, to bridle the tongue, to not be quarrelsome or greedy, to practice patience, and to know the power of prayer. Be prepared to say amen or ouch as James speaks directly to you in this letter. I think that's a pretty good setup for what's, for what's in store for us. Uh, and, and I'm excited about it. And it's been years since I have led an adult study in a class back here. So I, I'm, I'm more used to uh, the junior, junior high level. So, so bear with me, help me, and we'll get through this together. Now, does anybody have any questions or comments before we get started? All right, as we begin with the introduction and the background, we first want to start with what, what, what the book of James does not specifically address. So th- this, this epistle of James is not a book containing examples of conversions. James addresses those already converted to Christ. So if we're looking for the conversions, we need to be, we need to be looking at a different book. We need to be in Acts. Um, it's not a book containing the miracles of Christ to prove his deity. Nor is, a discussion, nor is it a discussion of the birth, the life, the ministry, the death, the burial, the resurrection of our Lord. All these are already accepted and, and assumed to be true by, by whom the letter, letter is written to. It does, not focus, it does not focus on subjects like partaking of the Lord's Supper, giving, establishing Bible authority and singing, nor does it provide doctrinal instruction on the scriptural worship and the work of the New Testament church. It doesn't focus on the events of the day of judgment, but it does allude to Christ's second coming. Neither does it focus on the resurrection of the just and the unjust in detail. This letter is not addressed to a specific church at one location, but rather to individual believers in general. However, it it, it focuses merely on on the individual's faith and how an obedient believer is to live godly in this present world. And friends, I think that's why you're here. And I think that's why we all are going to study this, because we need to know this, how to live godly in this present world. So that, that's, that's just what it, what it does not specifically address, some of those things. Secondly, uh, as far as through, through kind of the, the flow of this, of, this, uh, of this author's material here, who is, who, is, uh, who is the writer of the epistle? Who, who's, the, who's the author of James? I mean, James, right? So, the first, first word, James. James 1 1, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. <clears throat> Greeting. So, the first word of the book identifies the writer. 
How many times is the word James or the name James found in the New Testament, though? I mean, we've got, we got over at least 40 times. We've got 40, 40 times the name James is used in the New Testament. So the question is, which James are we talking about? Um, and then for me, you know, the, the who and the when, to me, that's always been kind of, especially the when has always been a hard subject for me, the time frame. Um, but we'll get to that in just a bit. But Okay, so what John said summarizes about two pages. <laughs> so we're going to, so that, that's really good. That's, re, that, that's, that's great. But the options, the author puts out some options, right? So we're, we're just going to run through this. So James, the son of Zebedee, you know, that, that's, that, that was an option. Matthew 4, 21, <clears throat> when, uh, just read Matthew chapter 4, verse 21, and going on from thence, he saw two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, and the ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Um, also mentioned as, as the son of Zebedee, Mark chapter 3, and verse 17. Generally, he's, he's almost always listed, this, this James, James, the son of Zebedee, is almost always listed with his brother uh, as the sons of thunder. Uh, or even uh, mentioned along with his brother again in Luke chapter 6 and verse 14, or Matthew 17, verse 1. So this James seems to always be paired with his brother James. This, this James, uh, in Matthew chapter 10, 2 through 4, was one of the 12 apostles. So that's, uh, uh, that, that's the other account there. So, and then we see in Acts chapter 12 and verse 2, the king of Herod, or excuse me, the king Herod beheaded James, estimated to be around 41, 40, 41 to 44 A.D. Uh, many consider this death happening so early in the history of the church as to rule out the possibility of him being the author. So there's, there's, this, there's this James ruled out. Option two is James, the son of Alphaeus. Um, Alphaeus is the father of James the Less. Uh, our author adds that the writer doesn't assert his apostleship as Peter does uh, in 1 Peter 1, 1, or 2 Peter 1, 1, or as Paul in Romans chapter 1 and 1. Um, he adds, it would appear that the writer of this letter was so well known and prominent that he could simply say James, a bondservant of God, and Christians in the first century would immediately recognize the identity of writer. Uh, so on, an additional thought, only a very prominent person could use such a common name without further invest, uh, identification. And to suggest some obscure James, it just, it just wouldn't be convincing. So that brings us to, to John's point there. So option three, it's James, the Lord's physical brother, and who is consistently referred to by his personal name alone. And there's, and there's tons and tons of accounts. Matthew chapter 13, and verse 55, uh, is, we read, Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren James and Joseph, Joseph and Simon and Judas? Similar account in Mark chapter 6 and verse 3, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon? Are not these his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. Um, just a few more accounts. Acts chapter 12 and verse 17, we read, But he, Peter, beckoned unto them with the hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, Go show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. 
Uh, Acts chapter 15 and verse 3, we see you know, this, this James is very outspoken. He's bold in the truth. After they held their peace, James answered and said, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. At this point on, from 19 through 21, he's given his advice to not trouble those Gentiles that are turning to, that have turned over to God, excuse me, that have turned to God over circumcision, but write unto them to stay away from pollutions of idols and from fornication, from things strangled and from blood. And then again, he's mentioned in, in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 9 uh, from Paul. It says, And when James, Cephas, and John who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me. They gave to me Barnabas, the right hand of fellowship, that they would go into the heathen and, and they into the circumcision. Uh, and even, and the last one that I have, uh, speaking of this, this James in Jude chapter 1, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James to them that are sanctified by God, the Father, and preserving Christ Jesus and called. So consistently, over and over and over, and there are many other verses, consistently this James is referred by his personal name alone. As, as James, the brother of Jesus. Um, so just, 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 at least in my mind, to close out those other arguments, the early church knew James so well that the writer who penned the epistle did not need to identify himself other than, other than James. They, they realized who it was. Um, and after reading you know, several of the New Testament passages, it seems that, that, it's, that it's probably this, uh, this physical brother of Jesus, James. Um, and as we go through our, our lesson material, um, the author of this, of this material has that same thought. So the questions revolve around this James being the brother, being the brother of Jesus. Um, you know, I've read, I've read another, ever, several other commentaries and study, study books that uh, one of the thoughts was that it, it never actually says in Scripture uh, that I've seen any way so so don't push it. If God didn't reveal the particular name, then, then it must not be a no, must not be a must for me. Uh, and furthermore, it really doesn't change the significance of the letter. The information is still the same. Uh, the meaning is still the same. Does anybody else have any thoughts on that? I mean, John summed that up really, really well. And, that, and that's, that's what is commonly thought, commonly believed that this is James, the brother of Jesus. Some, just, just some additional thoughts as we get going into this. Um, and you mentioned uh, Josephus there. And although, although they're not inspired early historians, the writers of Bible, um, the writings of Bible scholars and commentators are profitable in, in determining some of the dates and the kings and corresponding events and the authenticity of the book of James. We've got writers such as the uh, Clement of Rome in AD 96. He cited James in his works and was acquainted with the book mentioning James specifically one, chapter 1, verse 8, chapter 2, verses 23 and 25. Another is Polycarp, who was a, a quote-unquote Christian, Christian bishop in Smyrna, uh, A.D. 155, who referred to James in his writings. Some other guys, I can't even pronounce their names, but Josephus mentioned several events that, that correspond to the, to the biblical teaching found in James um, and authenticates his writings as reliable sources of information. We have more recent scholars like, like James M. Toll, Rick Billingsley, Robert Harkrider, Harkrider and Wilson, Ad, Wilson Adams. They offer valuable insights um, as, we're, as we're digging in these commentaries looking for deeper understanding. But as we go through our study, all these commentaries and outside resources, you know, they're, they're really, 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 really good information to help. But they're not incapable of error. So the inspired scriptures are never wrong, so as best we can... Uh, in any Bible study, uh, we need to use the Bible as its own commentary. So, so now, now to the date. And this is, I'm probably the least qualified person in here to talk about dating of anything because I've always struggled when it comes to when a book is written. I understand that, that it's helpful to, under, to know that and to know why some things are written. But the time frames are always, always really difficult for me. Um, I mean, as we get, I mean, does anybody have any thoughts on the date as we get going? I mean, I got, I got some material here to talk about, but yours would probably be more interesting.
Um, yeah, and, I mean, to that point, just to kind of tie sometime, some dates together, in James, James chapter 5, the first six verses, there's lots of, and I, I, think this was, I think this was in our book, or in the material here too, I think. Um, <clears throat> there's lots of focus on um, economic inequalities, and a lot, of, a lot of the rich versus the poor. From, from what we, we studied here, what we read here, it says the condition largely ceased after the, after the Roman-Jewish War in AD 66 to 70. So there's your 70 time frame. So, um, the, James, the physical brother of Jesus, was said to have died around, around 62 AD. So I think that's what I, what I saw. So that would, uh, that would limit the, for when the epistle would have been written. So around mid-60-ish somewhere in that range. Um, and then, in James chapter 2, and verse 7, <clears throat> James chapter 2 and verse 7 says, do not, do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which you are called. So that, that, only, that verse there is just as a reference. We see Christians already suffering persecution. The name Christian that was mentioned way back in Acts chapter 11, verse 26 which is already being used and is being ridiculed by unbelievers. Uh, and as far as the time frame on Acts eleven twenty six, when Barnabas goes to Antioch, that's that around 41 to 43 A.D., that time frame. So as far as when it was written, I mean, after, after 40, as, as John said, the mid-60s, somewhere in that range before 70 anyway. Um, James also mentions orphans, widows, uh, and brethren in poverty, in James chapter 1 and verse, verse 27, we see their pure religion undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. So there, there's our orphans and our widows mentioning in James uh, 2, 15, through 15 to 18, uh, a whole, whole list there of, of, of poverty and, uh, and just, just really bad conditions. We have, we're told of, uh, of a great famine in Acts chapter 11, verse 28. A great famine hit Judea around 44 A.D. as prophesied by Agabus in, in Acts 11, 28. Acts 11, 28 reads, And there stood up one of them named Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that there should be a great dearth throughout all the world that came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Um, Claudius Caesar reigned from 41 to 54 A.D., so that, that kind of kind of adds to that time frame a little bit for for the for the poverty part of it. So the time frame we, it's been discussed, you know, uh, mid 40s to early mid 40s to mid 60s, something like that. Anybody else got any thoughts on it? John, anything else, please? <laughs> All right, so I guess the next, the next big topic would be to who the letter was written, who it's written to. Let's see, James chapter 1 and verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, Greeting. So who are we talking about? <laughs> okay. It, 
in Acts, Acts chapter 2 and verse 41, the book of Acts records about 3,000 souls that were added. So that's Acts 2, 41, about 5,000 believe in Acts 4 and 4. And also the number was multiplied in Acts chapter 6 and 1. Um, I had, I had Paul's thoughts on this. Paul, in his speech to King Agrippa, uh, affirming that the 12 tribes then existed, uh, in Acts chapter 26, verse, beginning of verse 6, probably denoting the whole group of God's people. Uh, Acts 26, verse 6, it says, And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made unto God our fathers, excuse me, made of God unto our fathers, and to which promise our 12 tribes instantly serving God day and night hope to come. For which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. And Paul seems to address all Christians as children of Abraham by faith uh, in, by, in Christ Jesus in Galatians chapter 3, verse 7 and 9. So, uh, yeah, Miss Carol, I mean, it's just, just a whole, whole group. Yes, sir. Uh, if we compare James 1.1 1, 1 to James 1.2, uh, it says, my brethren. I mean, to me, that, that's, just, that's just more of a, of a general. I love that, brethren. My brethren, count it all joy, it goes on. But my brethren, as compared to James 2.1, my brethren have not the faith. So my brethren, uh, my brethren seems to pertain to his, as has been mentioned, his beloved spiritual brotherhood. Of believers, the word "brethren" is used at least fifteen times by the writer here. So, so w this idea of scattered abroad, of dispersion. The writer mentions James mentions initially the word dispersion was used of the Jews, uh, who from time to time have been scattered among the Gentiles, those Jews, those Jews who lived outside of Palestine. So in Acts chapter 8 and verse 1, we read, And Saul was consenting to his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And, there were, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And in John chapter 7 and verse 35, Then said the Jews among themselves, Whither, whither will he go that, he sh uh, that we shall not find him? Will he go to the dispersed among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles? So James isn't writing to, to, doesn't seem to be writing to unbelieving Jews. The word dispersion or scattered abroad must mean those who, who live in dispersion of the world. So those are just dis dispersed in the world. So just Christians in general, believers in general. Therefore, it seems the letter is written to the uh, 12 tribes, his brethren, Christians, who have been scattered due to persecution and other factors, which is what's been said. Brothers of the 12th tribe and refer, refer to the scattering as a 
diaspora. We may be saying a lot there, but we must abide by that. Like this is spirit of Israel and kind of making a point of emphasis that this is God's Israel as it ever was. It's in a spiritual form and not a physical one. Is that I think perhaps that you intentionally made Good. Thank you. All right, just, just last couple of notes that I have on that section with a couple other passages in Acts chapter Acts chapter eight and verse four. Uh, therefore, we are we are therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Christians today, in a similar sense, are commanded by our Lord to go into the world and to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, as did the early disciples. We can see, we can read in Matthew chapter 28, Mark chapter 16, uh, the Great Commission. Um, in all parts of the earth today, God's elect can be seen carrying the gospel or good news of Jesus Christ, which is according to God's foreknowledge. So, all right. Anybody else have any thoughts on that? Appreciate your comments. That's, that's good. Please. That, that he makes no, if, if David truly thinks he is, that he makes no reference to his uh, love brotherhood to Jews is pretty interesting. Um, and how many little brothers does Uncle Sam play some other brother? Like that is, like to him, that, yeah. that verse, like, if he went so far beyond.
I mean, it'd be easy to kind of. Anything else? John Calvin, have you written some, some guilt I don't know? Because in, in John 7, verse 4, John Calvin, on the side, but no one works in secret if you keep your mouth open. If you do things, show yourself to the world. But to me, it was like taking a shot. I'm like, yeah, go do these things. Go up and do these things. And it was just an insult and guilt. So. Well, I, mean, I see what you're saying. I mean, that, that that guilt could easily fall into the first four verses of the chapter. How to overcome that, how to get through it, and how to make yourself better. Okay? Good. So, where where was the letter written? Where was it written? You tell me. I'll see if your answer matches mine. <laughs> Jerusalem. There's one of these sections in here that on the I don't know it's on it's on the second page of this this lesson. It says complaints against the book. You know I I was I was reading over that and the more I thought about it you know I I don't know that that, that's that's pretty pretty good stuff. Um, Just just to read through this here it says just some complaints against the book that I pulled out of this uh, out of this material. It says, faith that results in justification is a faith which is obedient. In other words, having a faith that causes you to act or to be righteous in the sight of God. Having a faith that causes you to act a certain way or to be righteous in the sight of God. That's, that's what we want. we want. We want that type of faith that, that drives us to action. And, and we'll get into that in, in James. But uh, in, in Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, 1 through 5, uh, that was a passage that was, that was mentioned there. It says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like this, we shall certainly be united him with a resurrection like his. And verse 17 says, But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the, to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And I think that's, that's kind of what James, is, is the whole book is driving about, how to overcome and how to apply things, how to be uh, those, those that have been slaves of sin, Christians, those that, those that have been converted Converted sinners have been obedient from the heart to the standard that, that comes from Jesus. And that, that's what the whole book is about. In Romans chapter 16, verse 26 says, But now is made manifest by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandments of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. For the obedience of faith. James helps provide practical ways for the believer to overcome those trials of life. The obedience of faith, and that's that's what that's what again what the book is about. One of the another another complaint it mentions here it says uh, it seems that the writer gives a low 
view of Christianity. I mean, totally untrue from what I'm seeing. Uh, and we've mentioned some of these verses already in Acts chapter 15. I think Michael, uh, I think Michael mentioned that, where James st- takes a stand on those who tried to, to blend elements of Judaism with Christianity. Um, in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 9, Paul mentions James as a man who seems to be a pillar in the truth. So, from, 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 that, from that comment, it says that the writer has a low view of Christianity. I'm, I'm uncertain how one can read the book and call it a low view of Christianity as, as some of the themes in the book themselves are speaking of joy and patience and an unwavering faith and enduring temptation, seeing God as a source of all things good, being slow to anger, Ideas of humility and pride, and, and, and there's, there's many, many other things that we'll get to. But this idea that, that they said that um, some may view this as the writer having a low view of Christianity, that, that just doesn't seem to be farther from the truth. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge positivity of the view of Christianity, how to overcome and how to be better. Sir? You, I think you, you said it, and that sums up a lot. It, it's seen many times as, as a step-by-step process or a step-by-step checkbox, and, it, and, it's, and it's a process of life. I mean, it's, it's not a... For me, it's not. It's a lot of times it circles. I'm starting back over to the beginning many times. So, um, and, you know, James, the first, in chapter 1, the first, two ver- first four verses, it isn't a, this isn't a Christianity that, that's... That's always practiced in comfort. Um, I mean, counting all joy, die, you know, many temptations, the trying of your faith works patience, and patience have a perfect work that you may be perfect and endure wanting nothing. It doesn't, that doesn't happen by checking a box, does it, Miss Carol? I mean, it, this, is, this is being tested and tried and overcoming. Yeah. It's a good, uh, good illustration of hope, isn't it? Thank you, guys. That's it. So we'll pick back up there on Wednesday, and we'll, we'll just jump into the lesson and try to get through it as best we can. I appreciate all your comments and your help.